feel like I've delivered on many things and there's so much more yet to do. My leadership style would definitely be different than what's happening right now. Let me hear you say, hola! Seattle City Council member Teresa Mosqueda is running for a second term to double down on progressive solutions to the city's problems. This is in there right away. Civil engineer Kenneth Wilson is a political newcomer with a passion for building bridges in the community. But the two candidates have starkly different ideas on economic recovery, homelessness help, and police reform. The programs that we have are no plan at all. What direction will voters support? What I have done is focus on solutions. That sounds great. The citywide race for Seattle City Council Position 8, next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. Civil engineer Kenneth Wilson is facing off against incumbent Teresa Mosqueda in the race for position eight on the Seattle City Council, a citywide seat. Mosqueda emerged from the August primary as the clear front runner, but recent polls show Wilson, who's never run for office before, may be starting to make up some ground. It's a choice between a political newcomer promising new leadership and an incumbent who wants to keep her progressive agenda rolling as voters make the call on council position eight. Um, what was the big announcement that they made? Teresa Mosqueda chairs the budget committee on the Seattle City Council, and she's banking on another four years in office. I'm not only a progressive, I'm an effective progressive. She won 59% of the vote in the 11 candidate August primary and, as of the last week of September, has raised more than $245,000 for her campaign. She's endorsed by Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, the MLK Labor Council, Washington Conservation Voters, and the IAFF Local 27 Seattle Firefighters Union. I am asking to come back to council because now, in the wake of COVID, is exactly the time to be doubling down on investments. Those investments include tiny house villages, hotels, and RV safe parking lots to deal with homelessness in Seattle, which Mosqueda says will be a top issue if she's reelected. I agree with the frustration and concern about the need to address the growing crisis, and that's why I'm going back to council to act with urgency on these issues. Mosqueda is also eager to invest in more affordable housing via the jumpstart payroll tax on big businesses she sponsored a tax that's faced criticism as the economy tries to recover from the COVID pandemic. We need to right side up our upside down tax system and jumpstart Seattle progressive payroll tax is an important element of our solution to investing in progressive revenue for housing and equitable development. When it comes to revenue and spending on the police department and the record number of officers leaving the SPD, Mosqueda says there's a message she needs to make clear. Armed officers don't equal public safety. She says she'll continue the council's work to put more money in community-based public safety solutions and redefine the SPD's role. When we invest upstream and we invest in non-armed officer responses, which could still be through Seattle Police Department, that that actually can still be a response um, and a preventative response to, to crime. The city is actually making their facility. Challenger Kenneth Wilson is calling for change on a council he says is heading the wrong direction. I think my leadership style would definitely be different than what's happening right now. Wilson, who's never run for office before, earned just over 16% of the vote in August, and as of the end of September, has raised more than $56,000 for his campaign. His website doesn't list endorsements, but he's supported by Kate Martin, third place finisher in the position eight primary and retired SDOT Director of Capital Projects, Richard Miller. His top contributors include former city council member, Margaret Pageler, and real estate developer, Bob Ye. I think there's a lot that needs to be taken care of. This homeless issue has been getting worse and worse. Wilson, a civil engineer, would like to build a large rehabilitation facility for homeless Looking people good. on the site of a former King County Metro station in Northgate. And so that's the kind of plan that I'd like to do is infrastructure, bring it back so that we have a permanent facility that's valuable to our community and make a real difference in these people's lives. 
Wilson says his non-political background helps him see common sense solutions. He says issues like reallocating funding from the police department are clear. They need that money to train their people to make sure the people that are there are happy and comfortable and going to be able to do their job successfully. So there's no way we should be pulling back money from the police, and I would never do that. Wilson says his top priorities include homelessness, infrastructure challenges, and protecting Seattle's green canopy. I think that's really important for a community where we have this density and kind of our built environment. This is a three-span continuous structure. He's criticized Seattle's approach to the West Seattle Bridge Project and says he'll take a fresh approach to rebuilding the economy, too. We need to build back capacity to our system and get our businesses back to strength. So it's really about safety and addressing the homelessness and and also um, enabling for the laws that are on the books already. It's a new political name against an established progressive leader as voters citywide make the call on City Council Position 8. I feel like I've delivered on many things and there's so much more yet to do. I'm running for City city of Seattle Council to make a change. And here we have the two candidates for City Council Position 8, Teresa Mosqueda, the current incumbent, and Kenneth Wilson, her challenger. Thank you both for being here. Councilmember Mosqueda, you won the coin toss before the show. You'll be speaking first here. Tell us why you are running for this position again, please. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you to the voters who have voted me into office the first time around and with 60% of the vote in the primary have shown that they want someone who's not only progressive, but someone who's progressive and effective. I've worked over the last four years to pull together diverse voices, differing opinions to try to tackle some of our city's most challenging crises. We came together around workplace protections for hotel workers and domestic workers. We came together to pass progressive revenue that included large business and small business, along with worker and housing advocates at the table. We found solutions to help fund housing, and we are going to continue to invest in community safety. Now is so important to come together get away from divisive politics, and to really identify how we as a community can recover in this time of COVID. I'm here with you to support our smallest businesses, our most vulnerable community members, and our workers so that we can recover stronger. And for that, I'm asking for your vote again this November. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, Kenneth Wilson, over to you. Tell us why you are running for position eight. Thanks very much. I'm Kenneth Wilson. I'm a 28 year resident here of Seattle and I'm running for your citywide council position I'm a civil engineer with 30 years of experience in infrastructure projects, and I'm a Seattle small business owner since 2005. Um, My current projects, things you've seen, that uh, really beautiful Verendale Trust for Seattle Times had it on the cover just this last Sunday, and um, bridges over in pedestrian bridges over over Lake Station um, in Redmond area. So for the last 28 years, I've had my head down living, working in Seattle. I've been designing building retrofitting and inspecting bridges and tunnels for you, starting a bridge, starting my own small business. And I've been an important designer to many projects, for instance, the Magnolia Bridge, getting that um, open for us 20 years ago and bringing that back um, in just four months time and from February to June. But I'm here because the council is leading the wrong direction. Incumbent politicians can't find solutions to increasing homeless, failed infrastructure and in our roads and closed businesses. Public safety is the worst it's been in memory. And I, I'm i the one that has a plan to move this forward. And it's not about just more money. money. It's really about lack of accountability for this council and the decisions that have placed us at risk. Okay, and we're gonna dive into some of these issues here. Ken, maybe I can stay with you here actually and discuss your approach to homelessness, which is clearly a top issue for voters. You've proposed building a rehabilitation center to help homeless people up in Northgate using the old King County Metro station there. How would this impact the 4,000 people sleeping on the street in Seattle every night? How would you pay for a facility like this, too? Let's talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. So first things first, um, it's not it's rehabilitation is a fundamental of what's happening. So we have homeless people that actually have real challenges. And no matter how they've got there, we need to take um, responsibility and make make things happen for them. But on the same side of that coin, they also are real people. This is people that want to do better or need to do better so it's not just this isn't in a box this isn't just about pushing them one place to the other they have to be engaged and brought in right now we're not graduating anyone out of these programs we pile lots of money into these systems and they sit there and so they don't actually graduate out if you look at even the the tiny homes program 
how long do you want to live in a shed that has no fire system, has no, um, no running water? 400 days is their average of what's going on. So the programs that we have are no plan at all. We have to graduate them out and help these people to do what's necessary. The program specifically at Northgate is actually one that will re rehabilitate them, give them great access to the whole city through transit and also right there across from that North um, Seattle College so that they can have training and, and opportunities for a future to make better people. And that's really what we're about trying to make is graduate them okay. out. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Uh, Teresa, we've been in a declared state of emergency, as you know, on homelessness for five years now. A lot of people would say the problem has only gotten worse, especially the visible homeless that we've seen on our streets. If you're reelected, let's talk about your vision to try to solve this crisis. Well, the crisis has grown here in Seattle and across the entire country. We have seen the crisis of homelessness and unaffordable housing grow here in Seattle with a 20% increase in our population in just the last eight years. Couple that with people facing eviction, losing their job, losing their livelihood as small business owners during the time of COVID, we have absolutely seen an increase in the number of people who are living housing unstable and in the street. What I have done is focus on solutions. If we wanna have folks quote, graduate or move out of shelters, we have to build housing. We came together to pass Jumpstart Progressive Revenue. That is funding source that will two thirds go into housing solutions, permanent supportive housing. And the supportive housing element is critical. It means that people have case management, they have health services, they can get stabilized and they can get back on their feet. Two thirds of the funding is at least $136 million a year that goes into building housing. We have a crisis of homelessness right now because on a daily basis, there are only five shelter beds. You can count on one hand how many beds are open per night for the thousands of people living outside. That's why I've focused on building housing, creating additional beds through hotel sheltering models, supporting folks through tiny house villages. And these are tiny house villages that have running water, showers, laundry, that have a, a kitchen, that have case management on site. These are important temporary solutions that are not allowing people to stay outside and live in our streets and on and in our parks. The important thing to remember as well is that these shelters are successful with helping disabled folks and get them moved on if they have a house to move into. It is a 45% success rate of getting folks housed. 45% success rate for our non-congregate shelters to get people into housing is a critical tool. We had previously been sheltering folks in, in large mat on the floor situations with these congregate shelters prior to COVID. Those are not as successful as individual rooms. I am all in for all options. I have visited yeah. Tacoma, I've been to LA, I've been to Olympia. I want all solutions, but we have to create additional housing so that we can get folks into shelter, out of our streets and ultimately into homes. That's what I focused on and it is data driven. Thank you for breaking that down. I do wanna make sure that we move on to some other issues if we could, and public safety is a big one. Ken, let me start with you here. You've criticized the way the Seattle City Council has handled the police department and its budget. You've said it's hurt our community. Do you think we need more armed officers in Seattle or what would you do differently if you were elected when it comes to police and public safety? Uh, we absolutely have to reverse course on what's happening. Their cutting of funding has re has um, really reduced dramatically this the staffing there at the police department. So you can see and you can imagine what happens when 20 percent of your staff is suddenly gone. And even if you take this as a business analogy, if your restaurant, 20 percent of the staff is suddenly gone, the cook. The, the dishwashers, everybody is out now working in the kitchen, is now working the front room. The customers are having problems. The quality is going down. All your employees are extremely unhappy. This is our police department. When they cut the budget like that, all the detectives have to come forward. All the police people in the back room, they're not investigating programs because they have no way to do that. Chief Diaz knows where the problems are. He said so already, but he has no patrols to send it. They're sending one cop at a time, and in there, there's so many areas that they know there's a challenge, but they can't address them. So it's really about us going back and re-supporting our police, making a council that can engage and will willingly engage and work together with them, trying to give them time that they can outreach and be part of the community and rebuild. That gives them opportunities to de-escalate and to make things happen correctly, and most importantly, just to get the right amount of staffing that we can now address actual patrols and keep our our city safe. Public safety is the number one issue. And we, we really relate that to almost everything, everything from businesses coming back 
as sure. well as our homeless challenges. Have to enforce Thank you. the laws. Thank you for that. Uh, Teresa, I want to make sure that, that you respond to this because I know you and the council have been working on reimagining the SPD's role in public safety, working on more community solutions here too. When you hear that direction isn't working, public safety is getting worse, et cetera, we need more officers. How do you respond to that? Well, let's start with what officers have said themselves. Officers, folks that I am friends with, people who are currently at SPD have said, the city, the system is asking too much of police officers. We shouldn't be those case managers. We cannot be mental health providers. We shouldn't be showing up with a badge and a gun when what people need is housing and social services. That is coming from officers themselves. What we have done is we've been data driven again and we've looked at where we can deploy individuals that don't have a gun, that have mental health and case management background and deploy them to situations so that we can relieve officers to go to other situations, to do the investigations that they signed up for, to actually be there in a place where the community wants them to be, but not have to show up for mental health and case management services. And where does this come from? This comes directly from the Seattle Police Department's own commissioned report. The mayor and SPD asked for a review of the data that came in from the years from 2017 to 2019. They looked at 1.2 million calls that came to the call center. And what did they find? 80% of SPD calls were for non-criminal events. So when we think about reimagining, it's not removing officers from situations where they're required to be there with a badge and a gun. It's actually moving folks in who have case management and mental health backgrounds, housing services to come in to help those individuals. What we have also done to be very clear is fully funded the hiring plan that the mayor had requested. For every position that SPD and the mayor said that they had the capacity to fill, we funded mm -hmm. that last year. What we're dealing with here locally is a national conversation about what it means to reimagine public safety, how we can get dollars upstream into education, housing, mm -hmm. youth violence prevention programs. And the conversation is more than just words on a piece of paper it's actually making sure that our community has the dollars that they have deemed as necessary to reduce that violence remove guns from our youth's hands and to help stabilize and house folks that's actually reducing the chance that anyone will ever interact with a police officer to begin with let's not forget why we're having this conversation far too many people have lost their lives at the hands of officers who have shown up with a badge and a gun when what we needed was case management and an alternative response to addressing public safety Thank you for talking about that. And Teresa, I want to stay with you to talk about economic recovery. You touched on this earlier as we try to work our way out of the COVID pandemic. You sponsored the legislation for the payroll tax, this jumpstart tax that Seattle's going to start collecting next year. What is the impact of this tax going to be? You touched on housing earlier. And I also want to make sure you respond to this. Some people believe this is unhealthy for the economy. We'll push businesses out of Seattle. Your thoughts on that? Well, my thought on that is that the headlines have proven differently. We see Seattle Times reports, um, we see the Business Journal reports talking about how Seattle has seen a growth, a growth in the high tech industry. We now have one of the highest markets for unicorns, and that means um, startup small business tech firms that are starting right here in Seattle. These are ostensibly the individual companies that will be paying this assessment under Jumpstart, but it's a small assessment to pay into a system that helps house folks, that creates economic resilience, that makes sure that people aren't sleeping on the doorsteps of prosperity right here in Seattle. Where the funding goes is directly into things that businesses, large and small, have told me that they need, that come from the, the mouth of labor and housing advocates as well, who've all come together to say yes, we know that this tax is important because two thirds goes into housing Seattleites and creating more affordable housing options, home ownership options, and permanent supportive housing. The thing we need to address homelessness. The remainder of the funding goes into Green New Deal investments so that we're creating a new economy um, and one that's rooted in uh, energy efficiency principles, workforce training, economic resilience for small yeah. businesses, and we're also making sure that we're investing in equitable development initiatives so that more small businesses, especially women and minority owned businesses can have a start after this pandemic. It's a good jump start to our local economy and that's been proven by the data. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Ken, I wanna make sure I talk about your plans for the city's economy yeah. here. Are you focused on downtown, on Seattle's neighborhoods? Are worst in the country, regressive tax system. Let's talk a little economics, please. So, so thanks very much, Brian. And unfortunately, I need to swing back around on this too. So recovery okay. is fundamental to um, our public safety 
can't happen without recovery. So let's back up for a quick sec. Okay. You know, Teresa was talking much about how um, the responsiveness of police, which is absolutely 100% down. I mean, the, um, the, you can see the Seattle Times for the response time. You can also talk about non critical or non-emergency responses. There is a non-emergency number. It's in my phone number. You don't have to call 911 for non-emergency. And the fire department is having to respond to all the homeless issues and many things as well. So right now to pretend that the activity is going on is correct and that she's actually funded correctly when they clawed back $15 million of dollars that they could have been spending. This is public money that the people have handed you as a council to do better with and actually okay. use for police. So this comes back to our recovery. How do you recover with, with a problem of public safety? You saw the, the coffee shops are closing. Who's going to be the one to defend the, the tip jar? The employees mm. don't want to work downtown. Recovery is fundamental to this policing and public safety. And for us to gloss over it and pretend that it's actually activity that was sanctioned by the, the, the mayor has selected we want a smaller police is not correct and is the wrong response. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Brian, uh, I Teresa, I feel like there's a response here. Please. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, you know, fire department was mentioned and the fire members of IAFF Local 27 have endorsed me. They have endorsed me because they have seen how I will listen to first responders and invest in systems that actually re address public safety and relieve officers, our police officers, from having to show up to situations where there's not an officer that's necessary. The fire department I've worked with very closely to stand up the Health One vans. These are alternative responses to public safety so that you have a firefighter and case, and case manager who shows up. We have funded the triage um, response system and firefighters have been working with me to make sure that mental health situations are addressed. Why? Because they both see that I'm going to respond to near term and long term investments to make sure that public safety is stably invested in. That is why members of Local 27 have endorsed me to make sure that we are investing in making sure that alternative um, uh, first responders show up so there is not a revolving door at our jails, not a revolving door at Harborview, and that people actually get the health and safety that they need. So I do think it's important to look at the list of endorsements. Everyone from Pramila Jayapal to Bernie Sanders to the firefighters and the building trades have endorsed me because they see someone who is solution driven, understands the complexity of the problems, and is going to work with others to solve it, not just sling mud. Thank you. Thank you for the response there. Teresa, let me stay with you if I could. I want to talk about the work that you and the council are doing when it comes to zoning in Seattle. You've led the effort to Renamed single family zoning as neighborhood residential. You've been talking about rezones across the city to make Seattle more equitable and affordable. Uh, tell us about your approach on zoning, what you're working on, what that means for the future of the city. Thank you so much, Brian. I'm really proud of the work that we've done over the last few years to make sure that there's more funding for affordable housing, more home ownership opportunities, and that our seniors have the ability to stay in place and not be pushed out of uh, their homes that they want to retire in and stay in with their families. We need to couple those investments with a zoning policy that is truly more inclusive, that allows for us to look around the fabric of the city and see that when we have duplexes and triplexes and small apartments in, in neighborhoods like my old neighborhood in Queen Anne, that mm -hmm. is already part of the fabric of the city. When you have a city that has single family name, you assume that there's single family standalone um, homes in that neighborhood and that's all there is and so it becomes a different conversation when you think that's all there is but my apartment in queen anne when i ran for office the first time was actually zoned out of existence it was zoned mm. into single family homes and what we need to recognize is that those apartments duplexes triplexes etc these missing middle homes are already part of the fabric of our city and let's talk about how that inclusivity makes us diverse and more equitable and i hope as we continue to build on that more yeah. affordable Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Ken, I wanted to make sure I talked about we talked about this with you, zoning and development as well. Preservation of the tree canopy. I know you've been talking about that quite a bit. What's your take on what Teresa is saying about this idea of rezoning the city? How would you handle these issues like up zoning if you're elected? Uh, so I would be very much against it. So zoning is actually a protective element. It's about function. How does your city function? So if you change the zoning, for instance, I live in that Wallingford area where everything is a one way one lane road if you suddenly mm. change function and now you have every car in the world because of this multi-use which she's talking about is very detrimental nothing functions right nothing works correct you're gonna have to rebuy the sewer systems because they weren't made for 29 bathrooms they were made for 16 
and they were made a long time ago. So it's really important that the people that are talking about zoning don't understand the ramifications of what they're really talking about. And for instance, when they did make Hall a change here in the Wallingford area, every one of those houses that's taken down and put up six, what happens actually, has it made it more affordable? It absolutely has not. If you're trying to push for affordability, there is access along arterials, which should function differently. Absolutely. And so protecting tree canopy happens in the neighborhood. It's valuable to all our system. Those that are on the arterials with heavier development, those within that, that neighborhood, they get a better advantage of it as well, making the area more walkable. But most okay. importantly, how we get this affordability and zoning, they're, they're accidentally using the wrong statements to try and create this. We need to get people into more ownership and opportunities in that fashion. So if they can function in that way, we'll get better value for long-term about this asset. Thank you for that. We are just about out of time here. Closing statement time. Teresa Mosqueda, you're first. I can give you 30 seconds. Well, thank you very much, Brian, and it is wonderful to be back with you again. Um, folks, I've been endorsed by people like um, the Washington Conservation Voters and Sierra Club because they know that when we fight for more inclusive Seattle, it also means less farmland and uh, forest land is being encroached upon. We can do both building more affordable housing and setbacks to support our tree canopy, which I've done. I've been supported by folks from labor and business and making sure that folks from the environment and um, health sector have supported me because they know I look through every public policy through a public health lens. That is the most pressing issue facing our community and our country right now. I will continue to do so from public safety to investments in small businesses and workers and hope to earn your support again this November. Thank you very much. Can you get the last word here? 30 seconds if you can. Thanks so much. So Brian, um, Seattle needs a council member like me. We're a very complicated um, city and we need someone trained in the infrastructure, one who can ask the right questions on city of Seattle and protect our great city's infrastructure we're, we, each of these council members lack the training and understanding basic requirements to well run this safe and safely run this city, sewer, power, water, transportation, safety, businesses. As a small business owner and an engineer, I'm used to working these hard problems and I'll get real solutions for homeless, protecting our tree canopy and lasting support for our public safety and police. I'm asking for your vote and I'd appreciate your, your look, thanks. All right, thank you both, and we will be right back. What are people saying on social media about the future direction of the Seattle City Council? One writes, time for the Seattle City Council to start taking public safety seriously to best support businesses. Another comments, Seattle needs representatives that look out for the best interests of Seattleites, not a few special interest groups. We'd like to know what you think send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Coming up next week, the race for Seattle City Council Position 9. Activist and attorney Nikita Oliver faces off with small business owner and former City Hall staffer Sarah Nelson in a battle for a citywide seat. That's on the next City Inside Out. I hope you join us.